But when I hear you talk, I feel like I'm listening to someone who still doesn't believe we're in a crisis. And I think we're in a crisis. This session is on the global impact of Australia's wildfires. We're not here to talk about the wildfires as so much as how do we overcome this problem? How do we fix this problem that we've been, um, you know, that, that is, a, is a global crisis. We know the area devastated uh, twice the size of Belgium. We've all heard about the massive damage um, to, to humans, you know, communities, wildlife and nature has been appallingly hit. Uh, but we really want to focus here on how to stop this thing happening again. Um, very, very happy to be joined and, and, and proud to be joined by uh, Matthias Cormann, Minister for Finance, um, Leader of the Government in the Senate of Australia. Uh, Carlos Afonso Nobre, Director of Research at the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. And uh, Dr Nobre, I'd love to hear your views and bring you in to talk about how we, um, your experience studying forests and their link between climate change and how we can, um, what lessons we need to be learning. And Lynette Woolworth, you're an artist uh, from Studio Woolworth in Australia, you're a cultural leader. Last night you were um, uh, named as one of our Crystal Award winners for 2020. The format, as I said, will hopefully be interactive. We'll encourage you to uh, ask questions, make comments, just stick your hand up and I'll find a good way of bringing you into the conversation. What we generally do is start with a round of questions just to introduce our speakers and get the conversation going. So if I may, Minister Cormann, I'll start with you. As Finance Minister of Australia, what steps are you prepared to take to bring down the country's climate-related risk in the future? Well, I mean, Australia is taking effective action on climate change. We are one of a handful of countries that is on track not just to meet but to exceed and beat uh, our emissions reduction targets agreed to in the Kyoto by 2020 by more than 400 million uh, tons of CO2. Uh, not many uh, countries uh, can, can say that. We are on track uh, to meet and beat our emissions uh, reduction target agreed to in Paris by 2030. And uh, yes, the uh, top line emissions reduction target that we uh, locked into, 26 to 28 percent. But when you assess that on a, a per capita basis, Australia is a large continent, uh, comparatively small population, uh, 25 uh, million uh, people. On a per capita basis, we're reducing emissions emissions by uh, half, by 50 percent, uh, that is, uh, you know, higher uh, than, it's more ambitious uh, than uh, countries like across the European Union, uh, Canada, uh, New Zealand, Japan and others. Uh, and indeed, in terms of uh, uh, emissions intensity of the, in the economy, emissions per unit of GDP output, uh, you know, we are uh, committed to reducing uh, emissions by uh, two thirds. Uh, so, you know, we, we believe that we uh, are very ambitious. I mean, obviously, uh, climate change is an issue that can only be addressed effectively at a global level and uh, all countries around the world need uh, to contribute and we believe that we are contributing effectively guided uh, by uh, a, a, a desire to pursue policies that are environmentally effective and uh, economically responsible and uh, you know we, we believe we're doing our bit um, and on that point it sounds like Everything's on track. Are you, are you having reflected upon the past month or the two months and, and the, the forest fires we've been having? Has that, is that going to trigger any kind of change in policy? Well, you know, obviously, uh, you know, in, in the context of um, resilience uh, to uh, climate change and climate change adaptation, I think that there is certainly more that we need to do in terms of, our, I mean, generally, um, Australia has been. Uh, you know, is, is, is well um, prepared to deal uh, with emergencies, but this was a particularly devastating, extreme uh, bushfire event. I mean, in Australia, Australia has experienced bushfires uh, for thousands of years. Indeed, Indigenous Australians have um, conducted uh, backburning operations in a, in a regular, methodical and very sophisticated uh, fashion uh, long before a European settlement of, of, of Australia. And, um, you know, there's, there's no doubt that uh, climate change has had an impact and it, it worsens uh, the uh, intensity of the events and uh, there is certainly more that we need to do uh, to uh, deal with um, managing uh, the events when they occur and in, in, a, in a nationally coordinated fashion. I think the Prime Minister uh, in this uh, bushfire season uh, led an unprecedented nationally coordinated emergency response effort and indeed we uh, are providing significant investments uh, in terms of the uh, bushfire recovery uh, period with a $2 billion fund uh, directed into uh, helping uh, fire impacted communities uh, you know, obviously uh, rebuild for the future. Um, but but in, into the future, you know, of course, of course, there is uh, there's more that we need to do in terms of adaptation and, and um, resilience. And what about restructuring the economy, moving to green growth, one of the big watchwords of this meeting? <coughs> 
well, it, it, I mean, Australia's got a great uh, potential uh, to contribute uh, to uh, emissions reductions uh, globally. And uh, it's very important that the policy choices we make don't make it harder for Australia to um, help reduce global emissions. And, and let me say uh, that um, a black um, coal out of Queensland, for example, uh, which uh, is uh, lower uh, in ash and lower in uh, moisture than other options uh, being burned in uh, developing countries around the world, uh, can uh, make a contribution to help reduce uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, uh, every tonne of emissions uh, producing LNG uh, in Australia helps to reduce global emissions by five to nine tonnes, um, <clears throat> where it displaces particularly dirty, uh, inefficient, environmentally inefficient coal, coal sources. So, uh, I mean, and of course, Australia, I mean, in Australia, we, we um, 25 per cent of our energy supplies in our national electricity market comes from renewable energies. The projection is for that to reach 50 per cent uh, by uh, 2030. And indeed, our um, per capita investment in renewable energy and clean energy uh, is uh, more than twice uh, the level of Germany, the UK or France. I mean, again, people need to keep into perspective. Um, you know, Australia is a huge continent with a comparatively small population. I mean, when I speak to my uh, family and friends out of Europe, I mean, having grown up uh, in Belgium, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a kid, um, there seems to be a lack of perspectives on uh, a lack of perspective on how big uh, Australia actually is. I mean, you mentioned that an area twice the size of Belgium burned down. Um, and, and that's, of course, mentioned in the media. We always across, tell you, yeah, sorry. No, no, sure, but, but, let, but let me also so just make, as well. let, me, let me make the point that Australia is 256 uh, times the size of Belgium. Uh, and um, I mean, it's about 2% of the landmass of Australia has been impacted by those fires, about 0.4% uh, of, of, of our population. I mean, it's, it's devastating for those communities. And, and, you know, obviously our heart goes out to them. And on behalf of Australia, let me express our deep gratitude for the support, assistance and friendship that we've received from countries all around the world in the wake of this devastating um, bushfires. But, but it's, it's, it's important to um, also uh, look at these things you know, objectively and, and, and assess them objectively so that we can prepare our responses objectively. Some great points which we'll undoubtedly come back to. Um, Lynette, let's go to you first. You said, if I remember your, uh, your speech uh, correctly, I believe you said, we've seen the unfolding wings of climate change mm. yesterday. So let's, let's, talk, let's unpack that a little bit. And talk about your confidence in how we can avoid this situation and what needs to be done at the government level, what you'd like to see done at the community level, because as <coughs> the minister said, this requires all of society coming together to make uh, Australia more resilient to the, the disasters that befall it. Well, last night I focused my um, speech on leadership because I think that that's what we need. Uh, you know, this is, we can talk about these figures, we can say 2% of the total of Australia, or we can talk <coughs> about 30,000 koalas just from a Kangaroo Island alone, lost in the fires just most recently. So uh, there's the statistics and then what it, what it, what it means on the ground. And what I feel when I hear, I'm sorry, Matthias, but when I hear you talk, I feel like I'm listening to someone who still doesn't believe we're in a crisis. And I think we're in a crisis. I don't think that these fires are representative of all the fires that we've ever had. And I feel like we're, I know that the, the analogy is not correct, the frog in the boiling water is disproved scientifically, but I feel like that's where we are, where we keep saying we're adapting to something with, without jumping out of the pot by what I mean taking action and I don't want I don't want to be listening to how we're using our figures to meet these targets but not actually responding to an emergency that's happening so I think uh, we, we can make the assumption I'm making the assumption that we're living in a crisis and maybe the minister will disagree so what do we do about it what do you want to see done about it I want to see leadership from the top that we can follow confidently so we have a prime minister right now who's saying we'll do this we'll do that but we won't raise ele electricity our prices I will pay more more electricity if it is into if it gives me the chance to use renewables and it shifts us away from this trajectory that we're on power power that's anything else we can of course is the right to respond but let's keep the conversation moving look anything 
anything that's going to help, I really feel that the point is leadership because people will manage any sort of change if they have to. And I think that the conversation is continually around economics and never around the things that we value. We love our environment in Australia. We love the animals. We will do very many things to keep th those things protected. And what I would love is to see leadership from the top, which we can follow. The communities on the ground are doing what they can. But um, we all know we are better. That's why we are here. We all know we are bettered by positive leadership that actually accepts what's happening and not trying to kind of always suggest that it's really not that bad. Okay, so less numbers, more... more, more less dramatic. numbers, um, more listening. Minister, I'll let you get back to this, but <laughs> first, let's move to Professor Nobre, who's not Australian, but has acquired over his uh, professional lifetime a huge, immense knowledge on um, the linkage between forests and, and climate change. And, I want you to step in and give your considered opinion on what needs to be done, um, not just for Australia, because we have forest fires everywhere. You know, not everywhere, but in, in, in numbers of places in the past six months. Um, devastating um, impact on the environment globally. So let's not just focus on Australia here. Um, but I'm very interested to hear what your prescriptions are. Yes, devastating forest fires uh, everywhere. Uh, in mid latitudes and subtropics, they are uh, also there. Uh, the ecology is adapted to fire historically for millions of years. However, we are changing the basic state. And really, the uh, Australia bushfires show that we are very, very close to a tipping point. Uh, climate change is making higher temperatures, extreme droughts, much more frequent. If we look at Australia, you know, six out of the 10 most severe droughts and uh, warm years were in the last 10 years. So this is climate change. There is very little doubt that what we are seeing unfolding is due to climate change. I'm not going to get into the meteorological complexities, why this is happening, El Nino becoming more intense, the, the Indian Ocean dipole becoming more intense. This is uh, meteorological jargon, but those things are happening. The, the big question is if repeated situations like that happen, the forest will never have time to readapt. So that's why, you know, and, the, and the, most of the Australian scientists, uh, very reputed scientists, are saying that for over 10 years. Uh, if we are unable to stop climate, global heating, many ecosystems will disappear in the future. In Australia, of course, a very short-term measure for adaptation is recovering from this 60,000 square kilometer bushfire. Keep in mind that the fire was so intense because the temperature was so high, flammability was so high, that a large portion still being assessed of those forests, particularly eucalyptus forests, died. They were not only slightly affected, they died. So there will be, and I think this will be a good experiment, Australia will have to start the largest forest restoration project in the world. For that's, a, that's a good point, uh, Professor, because we um, you probably um, heard the President of the United States mention earlier today that he was, uh, uh, his country was supporting an initiative um, uh, being led by the Forum, in fact, to facilitate the planting and restoration of a trillion trees this decade. But we need to do things differently, right? Is it restoration? Is it replanting? What are the lessons and how do we plant uh, forests and, and create uh, woodland spaces that are less vulnerable in the future because we know that global warming is here? Well, again, for middle latitudes or subtropical ecosystems, you can restore forests. However, if the, the severity of droughts and, and warm temperature, very hot temperatures continue unabated, lightning strikes and it starts a fire. Sorry to say, it will be impossible to maintain those ecosystems if we are not, if we do not meet the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees. That's why it's a global responsibility, although <laughs> Australia certainly has responsibility as any other country. So we really have to get to net zero emissions by 2050 if we want to maintain those ecosystems, particularly in mid-latitudes and subtropics, but also in the tropics. 
We've reached the halfway stage, and uh, we've covered uh, we've covered our, our bases, I think, fairly well. Lots of different um, perspectives out here. Let's have a quick show of hands. I know some of you are going to want to ask questions. Um, okay, let's take those three. We'll take them one at the same time. Can we start at the back, sir? And uh, can you just give us your name for the benefit of those watching online as well? Okay. Well, my name is John Denny. I've just recently retired from um, oh, thanks from the uh, Fire and Rescue New South Wales. So well, I've spent the last 40 years of my life as a career firefighter. I work very, very closely with the volunteer firefighters as well. I guess more of a comment, but um, there's a significant level of frustration with the firefighting community. And they've been hailed as heroes, you know, for, for the outstanding work that they've done. But they really need to be listened to as well. Climate change has been happening. There's been a couple of critical fires, 2003 in Canberra, 2009 in Victoria, that have rewritten the textbooks on fire behaviour. The fires we've experienced recently are different to any other fires we've had. One, they've been so geographically extensive, there's no capacity from other states to come and assist because all states are now at their maximum in firefighting capacity. Two, we normally have severe fire seizures in, con in conjunction with an El Nino effect, a weather effect, that didn't happen with these fires. It was an El Nino neutral climate system and we still had these fires. And as pointed out, the, Australia is now the hottest it's been. And we've recorded record hot um, years over the last um, number of years. So firefighters are looking for political leadership to recognise and to take action. And really the fires that we've just experienced in, in in Australia are a wake-up call to the world and the clear message is the absolute need to reduce deeply and urgently carbon emissions. Thanks sir, we'll come to that one. Uh, could you just pass the microphone over to your neighbour? Um, Matthias, um, really glad you mentioned Indigenous land practices. Can you remind us of your name as well please? Uh, Sorry, Peter Holmes of Court. Um, Matthias, really glad that you mentioned Indigenous land practices and wondering if your government is thinking about supporting more of the traditional ways of managing the land in Australia and perhaps the economics of investing in that, saving great damage in other activities. Right, let's just put the microphone over here and we'll do the, take those three. I believe, if I'm correct, we have a, a non-Australian about to ask a question, so we're going to globalise this, this conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> John Hills from ITV News. Um, I suppose I wanted really just to find out whether your reaction to President Trump speaks. President Trump uh, spoke about uh, prophets of doom and uh, I think sort of felt that climate change activists were over-egging the science. Do you agree, Minister, with the President of the United States that people are being too gloomy about climate change? So let's take these in uh, order. So political leadership and firefighters, are you... Uh... Uh, well, OK, like, if, if I take them in turn, and this, this is obviously going to be an ongoing conversation uh, in, in a domestic context in Australia, and the Prime Minister has flagged and the government uh, is considering uh, what form uh, an inquiry, uh, a comprehensive inquiry, a Royal Commission or other inquiry, uh, might take uh, moving forward. I mean, right now we're still dealing with the emergency response. There's still uh, quite a few uh, fires burning, so that's the priority. We've started the uh, bushfire recovery process, but there will be a period uh, when uh, to properly work through uh, how uh, better to respond and, and, and you know what else we can sensibly do in, in relation uh, to, to these sorts of issues. I mean, I, I say it again, Australia uh, absolutely does its bit when it comes to uh, effective action on uh, climate change globally. Uh, there are not many countries uh, that uh, are going to beat uh, their emissions reduction targets uh, by 2020 agreed to in Kyoto. Uh, and um, you know, when it comes to uh, our Paris uh, targets, uh, looking at it on a per capita basis and on an emissions intensity of the economy basis, uh, you know, our ambitions uh, when it comes to emissions reductions are significantly higher than many other uh, comparable developed countries. Now, you know, when it comes to indigenous uh, land practices, uh, there has been some of it. I think there could be more. I mean, the Prime Minister overnight um, was, you know, in Australia last 
night, um, has been uh, making the point uh, that we need to focus on hazard reduction uh, as well as on emissions uh, reductions. And, and that, is, that is certainly something that Indigenous Australians did very, very well for, for thousands of years. Um, I mean, Indigenous Australians, and I know that uh, I had the great experience here in Davos in 2016 to uh, watch uh, you know, a, a movie, uh, an immersed uh, experience of watching uh, those Indigenous uh, land practices in action. And they, they were pursued for a range of purposes, but they also help mitigate the risk of large-scale uh, bushfires. Um, and and I mean, th that has to be. Uh, using those sorts of uh, methodical, uh, regular, sophisticated uh, methods into the future has to be part of the consideration. Uh, there, there's no question. Uh, in terms of President Trump, I thought he gave a great speech. It was an, a very uplifting speech. He was obviously focusing on uh, the great achievements of his uh, administration when it comes to boosting uh, economic uh, growth um, you know, in, in, in the United States and some of the uh, global issues and some of the global economic outlook. When it comes to um, uh, climate change, I mean, the Australian government's position is very clear. I mean, we are committed to effective action on climate change. We do understand that uh, climate change is something uh, that needs to be addressed. We also understand that the only way uh, that it will be addressed effectively is through a global response. And if we had a, a mature uh, global conversation about this, we wouldn't be um, doing constant finger pointing. We would actually be looking at how each country can best contribute, given the natural attributes uh, that uh, respective countries have to contribute to a, to a global solution. And we've always got to make sure that we don't have preconceived ideas on what um, blanket policy uh, propositions might uh, deliver the best possible impact because uh, you know carbon taxes has been mentioned the price on carbon when in Australia would actually make it harder for Australia to help reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. No question. I mean, we would be shifting economic activity uh, and jobs uh, overseas, where for the same amount of economic output emissions would be higher. Uh, we would be uh, making it harder to uh, export uh, comparatively cleaner energy sources into developing countries around the world, uh, where they uh, are currently, and, and can even more so into the future, are displacing less environmentally efficient energy sources. And that, that you know, obviously, uh, you know, f whether from from LNG uh, to uranium uh, to, um, to even to black coal compared to uh, brown coal options in other uh, countries, uh, as well as solar, wind, uh, hydrogen, and all of this, all of these other energy sources. I mean, there's no question. And again, on a per capita basis, and I hear what you're saying, you don't like to talk about numbers, but it's very hard to talk objectively about an issue without mentioning numbers. There's no question that Australia is a world leader when it comes to per capita investment in clean energy. I mean, the level of investment in wind, in solar, uh, in, in and, you know, the government is uh, pursuing, obviously, substantial investment and catalyzing substantial investment through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation uh, into clean uh, energy. I mean, there's, there's no question that, that we are a world leader when it comes to clean energy investment. There's always, you know, as technologies evolve and as, uh, you know, we, um, technologies improve, there's always more and better things we can do, but, you know, we're committed. Uh, one of the questions, one of the... Can I just cover like President Trump doesn't seem, sorry, uh, uh, back on the, the point about President Trump, uh, I take the points you're making, but President Trump doesn't seem to believe the science on climate change. Does that worry you? Uh, I'm not a commentator on uh, President uh, Trump's beliefs. I, I was uh, in uh, the audience. I thought it was a great speech. Uh, it, was, it was a fantastic speech. It didn't uh, worry you. Didn't I, 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 I thought he delivered a great speech about the economic achievements uh, of his government, and I, I think that's a great thing. Um, Professor Nobre, let's talk to you. Does it worry you that the President of the United States mentioned, uh, likened um, the, the, the climate community as uh, to prophets of doom? Well, of, co of course it, it worries all of us because it, it, since his election, his speech, you know, getting out of Paris uh, uh, Agreement, that really sent a very bad uh, signal to many countries, I, I think countries which were more committed to meeting their commitments to Paris Agreement, kind of, you know, are in a position, uh, for instance, even China, uh, China should really abandon completely coal fire power plants if we want to reach 1.5 and even 2 degrees. And that would certainly affect Australian economy exporting coal. So I think, you know, this really uh, very, very uh, trouble uh, political leadership coming from the U.S. 
because that's not even the position of the U.S. population. 74% of the U.S. population are concerned about climate change. So I, I don't think uh, uh, this is, is good for s sustainability in the planet. It's very bad. However, I think, you know, the population, particularly the U.S. population, will not really respond. And also, I, I'm not sure it's true whether uh, adapting or preventive adaptation will lead to bad or poor business. On the contrary, mm. uh, climate change gives an enormous opportunities. And the, the minister here mentioned uh, renewable energy, which is generating hundreds of thousands of jobs a year in the, in the world, also in the, in the United States. So I, I don't think, you know, defending, let's say, coal uh, mining and a, a very small community in the U.S. really is, is good for the planet. Yeah, I would like to say something about that. Keep it quick, if you don't mind. I'd like to do two more questions. Two things. I mean, there is the... I'm not against the numbers. I'm, I'm talking about values in addition to the numbers. I'm talking about how we weigh these things up. And we can say we're investing in renewables, but we've de-invested in re renewables. We can say that we're shifting, but we're opening large coal mines in addition to what we already have. So it's about where does this pendulum swing where it shifts in the direction of where we are actually heading? And not, and not continually trying to hold in balance things that may be incompatible for the future of the entire world. Well, just, just on that point, because, I mean, you know, obviously a high-profile coal mine in, in Australia is uh, the Adani mine. And, I mean, you know, I was at a session earlier with the Indian Commerce uh, Minister, and, you know, he made the point, I mean, India for the foreseeable future will uh, need to rely substantially, including in order to facilitate uh, increased uh, reliance on renewables, will need to rely on uh, coal for their uh, baseload power. Now, they'll have several options. Either they use a cleaner Australian coal with lower ash and uh, moisture content and higher energy intensity, or uh, they use dirtier, uh, environmentally uh, less uh, friendly and more polluting coal uh, in order to uh, achieve what they will seek to achieve, and that is to provide electricity to their people. Now, again, I mean, this is actually Australia making a beneficial contribution. Not every coal mine is a bad thing for the environment. I mean, when you have better quality coal compared to the alternative options that are available, you actually might be able to help through the transition uh, provide uh, better outcomes. Are we talking about transition, though, as a, as a government? Is the government talking about transition away from coal to renewables? Well, well, for the foreseeable future, coal will be a, a significantly important energy source. But, uh, you know, of course, I mean, we, we, we are providing uh, increased levels of, well, we, we're facilitating uh, increased levels of renewable energy. Um, and, and that will continue into the future. But, like, I mean, let's be realistic. In uh, countries around the world, I mean, 50% of global coal production comes from China. 50% of global coal production comes from China. Australia is responsible for 6% of global coal production. Uh, India, about 12%. The US, 10%. 50% of global coal production happens in China. Anyone for a last question before we start wrapping up? Lady in the front row. So, you, uh, let, let us know what your name is, please, and where yeah. you're from. I'm Lucina from Switzerland. I've been climate. I've been a striker uh, with Isabel too and Dominic. Um, so, as the young generation, this is the world you are leaving to us, and you are taking the decision right now. So, anyways, we are watching. And just a point I would like to bring that I heard this morning that I found very interesting was from an indigenous woman. <coughs> And I really think we should listen to indigen indigenous people because they have such like solution and connection to nature and the way how we can connect to it in order to rebuild the forests which have been completely burnt. Maybe you have a point to address about it, I don't know, but just to pass the message forward, I guess. Indigenous Australians were very, uh, were, were and are very good at managing fire. And you know, when it comes to hazard reduction burning, we could learn a lot of we could learn a lot from Indigenous Australians. There's no question. Um, I, I think that I mean one of the issues, not the only issue, but one of the issues. I mean, after an extended period of drought, in an Australian context, um, uh, the fuel load that had built up was you know quite extraordinary. And uh, if you have more regular 
uh, back burning and more regular um, hazard reduction activities, which are in Australia organised at the state level, it will help reduce the risk. There's no question. And, and that is one of the great things that Indigenous Australians showed uh, over many, many um, years. However, just for a small point, uh, if we reach three degrees, which is the commitment of the countries towards the Paris Agreement, we are not committed to 1.5 or 2. If we reach three degrees, this year summer in Australia will be every year summer. Mm. And if that happens, even the indigenous communities are not used for 16,000 years with that kind of climate. They may be very ingenious and come up with ways, but I'm not sure. Um, one final question for me, Ms. Minister, if I may. Um, I've just the benefit of coming from immediately from another session when we talked about net zero and uh, we had Greenpeace, we had Lord Stern, and we had a, a climate investor and very much the discussion was on the fact that um, there is the beginnings of a change, we're not at a tipping point yet, but we are seeing major action among sovereign wealth funds, amongst investors on de-risking their own portfolios and uh, moving away from fossil fuels, for example. So my question is very simple. In terms of your, the, the risk to the economy, do you think you've you know, accurately and, and are you happy with the, the, you know, the, the, your risk assessment of how insulated the Australian economy is? Well, I, I don't accept your analysis in terms of the nature of the Australian economy and the Australian economy uh, is uh, quite diversified. Yes, we do have a uh, you know, significant component that is made up of the resources sector of which the coal sector is a, is a, is a part. But when I say it again, I mean, there's a global demand for coal and um, if it's not met by a cleaner Australian coal, comparatively cleaner Australian coal, it will be met by comparatively dirtier coal from other sources and the world environment will be worse off. And I, I just, I, I just make the point again about Australia. I mean, Australia is a, a sunburned country of droughts and flooding rains. And these are not words that I've invented. These are words that were coined by Dorothy McKellar 115 years ago. I mean, you know, we, we, we do have to, yes, climate change is making things worse. We do have to have an effective response to climate change. We do have to have uh, effective uh, strategies to increase resilience and, and to deal with hazard reduction. But we've also got to keep it in perspective to the, in, in, in the sense that Australia has always been a uh, country that has, been, that has suffered extreme weather events on both sides of the spectrum. I think that's the challenge. That's the that's where we're, where we're poles apart. Because we can say this about our history continually, we can meet the challenge of this moment. And one requires a shift. And the shift in thinking is a thing that's very hard to hear from our, our leadership, I feel. I, I am waiting for the change that says, that acknowledges that this is unprecedented, that we haven't experienced this before, that even Indigenous people with their long-standing and continuing mosaic pattern burning um, would not be able to manage this. When do we change? And you made that point very, very, very eloquently, Lina. And unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, we need effective climate change strategies. We need uh, new hazard avoidance strategies. We need new ideas about how to replant forests. And we need solutions that take into account communities and firefighters and indigenous peoples. Thank you very, very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for watching us live online.